Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dina, for the kind introduction and for inviting me to this webinar series. It is uh, really my pleasure to talk a little bit more about um, established and emerging technologies uh, when it comes to fiber spinning. And um, I thought that I would start with uh, the three established fiber technologies. Uh, as a matter of fact, there aren't any more. So this is what is currently available in the market. And then uh, I would talk a little bit about uh, emerging technologies. Now, I have to say at this point already, there are a lot of different technologies um, popping up all over the world. And I, I hope you'll excuse me that I chose three that are from Finland. So all these are from Finland. Doesn't mean that they are the most uh, or furthest developed ones, but um, at least those are the ones that I know best about. So maybe I'm, I'm more suited to talk about those. Um, I want to point out that uh, for putting this stuff together, there's a very good uh, textbook on this. The chemistry of textile fibers gives a very good overview, as, at least of the established um, fibers. And also, I had the pleasure during the past years um, to get access to uh, knowledge presented by um, various experts, of course, foremost Herbert Sixta. Um, my former supervisor at Alta University, but also Gerd Krona. Um, he's working at Lensing, uh, and uh, most of the material on lyocell fibers is from him. And then Dr. Dr. Hayo Harms, former uh, CEO of Kalheim Fibers, where I got a lot of information about viscous fibers. So that I just wanted to point out. And before we talk about this, I thought I'll put this a little bit into context. So talking about um, fiber volumes on the market. And um, if we look at the natural fibers, then it is clearly cotton, um, the dominating fiber with 25 uh, million annual tons, only surpassed and surpassed by far by polyester. So polyester, we have almost 70 million tons per year of which most is filament fiber. So at this point, we can all already distinguish between filament and staple fiber. Filament is a continuous filament, uh, whereas staple fibers are short fibers with a distinct length. If we talk about um, cellulosic fibers, which is the topic of today, uh, then we are mostly talking about staple fibers. Filament is, is only a minor share. And there, as we will see, um, viscous is the most important process. And that is then also why we start with that one. Um, I hope you can see this, this GIF here moving that I found on the internet. Uh, it shows the viscous process and the, the many steps of it. And um, what I would like to do is now guide you through a couple of these steps to understand you what is needed in order to um, arrive at textile grade fibers when you start uh, from dissolving pulp or dissolving grade pulp using the viscous process. Before that, though, um, I want to point out already the immense application portfolio that uh, the viscous process offers. So we have, of course, textile application in both um, clothing and apparel, but also home textiles. But then there is so much more um, technical applications. We have non-wovens, we have wet lates, um, we have um, yeah, films even, so films typically known as cellophane. And there are a lot of different um, producers worldwide. Again, this is just a selection. By no means, this is a complete list of the um, manufacturers. There is really uh, a lot going on all over the world. The viscous process, and this is what I want to start with, is a very old process that was um, developed already at the end of the 19th century, usually credited to Cross, Beaven, and um, also Third Gentleman Beadle, uh, who filed the first patent. And then a bit more than 10 years later, the first factory um, started to run in Kuto, um, so in the UK at the beginning of the 20th century. And then over the year, this process was um, developed to a very great extent, um, also driven by two world wars, where especially European nations sought for independence of, of cotton supply. And um, this has to be understood in order to also gauge the impact of the viscous process. It's such an optimized process, more than 100 years now, and, and so diversified which explains that despite many problems that I will address a little bit later, it is still a very important um, technology that we need in particular for textile fibers. Now let's have a look at the different steps. The first one is alkalization, also called steeping, in which we 
essentially deprotonate the cellulose. So very simple, the, the cellulose, the shredded cellulose, typically uh, starting from pulp sheet, is soaked in 18% sodium hydroxide solution with a very high liquid to solid ratio, ra solid ratio of 18 at slightly um, elevated temperature in order to first deprotonate uh, the cellulose. And then it is actually led to rest and that is the so-called uh, aging step. And the aging step um, is here, as you can see, in order to decrease the DP, there are um, different uh, levels for a viscous level. We do usually go below 600. Um, for modal fiber, that is a viscous variant that I will talk about a little bit later. Um, we keep the DP uh, slightly higher. So if we start from dissolving grade pulp, then the DP is typically too high to be spun and this uh, degradation is needed or this first so-called aging step. But it does not only decrease the average DP of, so degree of polymerization, but as you can see here on the right-hand figure, as the aging progresses, the molar mass distribution of the pulp is also getting narrower. And also that is then important for uh, the subsequent spinning process. Now, in order to get the cellulose solubilized, the viscous process takes advantage of an intermediate soluble. And uh, this is done by a reaction with um, CS2. So the cellulose or the, the deprotonated aged cellulose is then reacted with CS2. It's a gas phase reaction. Uh, the targeted DS is relatively little, somewhere between 0.5 and 0.7. In the in a viscous industry, you usually talk about the, the gamma value. And that uh, derivative is then soluble in caustic. So as you can see here, 5 to 8% um, percent sodium hydroxide. And um, you have to cool this in order to solubilize this. Then this solution is then um, typically still filtered and deaerated in order to remove all the air bubbles before it advances to the spinning process. The viscous solution looks like something here on the right. Um, typically it is orange color and this orange color comes from one of the side products or side reactions that uh, CS2 in this particular medium can undergo. And it is uh, credited to this sodium trithiocarbonate and, and follow-up reactions then that give this viscous, this typical orange appearance. So these side reaction without going into any details should be something to um, be kept in mind later than when we talk about the disadvantages of the viscous process. After the solubilization, so after the xanthation and solubilization, there is yet another holding step, the so-called ripening process in which the uh, degree of substitution is uh, decreased a little bit. So we see here in green, the um, CS2 units or the xanthate units at the C6 position. Then we have here in, in purple at C2 and C3. And during this ripening process, the C6 position is usually unaffected. It's more the C2 and C3 that, um, that equilibrate a little bit, but also uh, decrease a little bit. So the overall DS is dropping slightly. And this is needed in order to achieve the so-called um, chemical, but also colloidal maturity of the solution. So essentially this is connected to the processability and spinability of the solution. If this step is not um, developed enough, then the, the spinability will not be very good. So you will have spin instabilities, breakages, and then you have to stop the process. So you can see already now due to these many steps, there is a lot of know-how there, a lot of optimization that um, each of the manufacturer typically keeps for themselves. But if you have arrived at this point, you finally have a solution that you can spin. And uh, the viscous spinning process is a wet spinning process, meaning that the solution is extruded directly into a spin bath or, or coagulation bath. Now in this depiction, we are spinning from the bottom to the top. And we have the, the viscous solution here indicated with this yellowish orange color. And then we have the spin bath. And in the spin bath, we typically have sulfuric acid. So our viscous solution, if you recall, is in sodium hydroxide. And then as we enter the spin bath, the pH is dropping drastically. And this drop first causes a coagulation. 
because the, the pH is dropping, the xanthate solution is not soluble anymore. And we have a, a precipitation, which since it's a physical process, we can also call coagulation. As the filament traverses further through the spin bath, we also start to saponify our uh, cellulose xanthate. So the CS2 groups are cleaved off by the action of the sulfuric acid. And now we have um, cellulose, pure cellulose again in a low pH medium. So now we also have chemical regeneration and the fiber solidifies. Now, if you think about how this works, we have a let's say a round uh, cross section in the spinneret. So we are extruding a, a round filament cylinder. Then this solidification, so both coagulation and regeneration is starting from the surface. And you, you form basically something like a sausage casing or like a mantle around a liquid core. You have a lot of um, diffusion going on now, sulfuric acid diffusing inside the filament. And then we have, uh, of course, sodium hydroxide diffusing out, but also gases, CS2 that is now liberated, has to exit. There is a, a lot of pressure. There is a lot of um, you know, osmotic differences in there. And uh, those all are contributing then to the secondary structure formation. And they basically then um, define the, the densification of the cellulose matrix, uh, orientation of the cellulose chains, and also the crystallinity of the entire structure. If you want to have strong fibers, then typically you want to increase the orientation of the cellulose. You want to increase the crystallinity and that is done by delaying the regeneration process or the solidification process. There are different ways to do so. One is with um, a zinc salt, zinc sulfate, for instance, that zinc salt can stabilize the xanthate intermediately, meaning that the CS2 is not coming off that quickly. So you, you have some sort of liquid gel phase present for a bit longer, you can stretch that a little bit longer and that stretch, we will see that very clearly then in the lyosyl process, that stretch can create orientation of the cellulose molecules. And then there are various uh, modifications. I, I will address very few here um, because most of them are not commercially relevant anymore. Um, as for instance, the Lilienfeld process where you um, spin into concentrated sulfuric acid, you get um, very good fibers, very strong fibers, but obviously processing in and so concentrated sulfuric acid puts a lot of stress on your processing equipment. And uh, for that reason is not very economically um, viable in the long run. So when you spin, you of course do not extrude a single filament like we had now in the scheme on the, on the previous slide, but you have uh, multi-filament bundles, you have clusters. So here is a picture of, of um, one such spinning factory and each of these tubings here is basically a spinning cluster um, containing several spinnerets. The spinnerets can have up to 2000 holes. So what you're extruding is a tau of single filaments um, usually several millions with um, a single thickness of something between 10 and 20 micrometers in a textile industry typically denoted in DTEX. So we are talking about something between 1.2 and 2 TTEX usually. The spinning speed is um, around 60 meters per minute. So if you recall um, below 100 meter per minute, that's, that's a good um, yeah, benchmark meaning that if we talk about polymer processing and if we would compare it with synthetic polymers, we are rather on the lower end of the spectrum, so rather slow in terms of spinning. Um, I mentioned already that most of the filaments are not continuous filaments when they're further processed, but they're staple fibers. So in this case, as you can see here, the filament is then continuously fed into a cutter unit. Cutter unit has rotating plates, and then you adjust the length of the filament of the staple fibers that you would like to have, and then um, these are further processed. These staple fibers then are typically washed. So in the first washing, we in particular aim for the desulfurization. So we want to get rid of all of the CS2 and byproducts that might have formed there. Then there's typically some bleaching step uh, to get rid of some chromophores formed from the viscous solution, but also cellulose immanent chromophores. 
And then you might have uh, also a finishing step before the fibers are then pressed to uh, decrease the water content. And then they are opened, then they are dried and baled and then shipped off to uh, the yarn manufacturer typically. Now CS2, the downside of it is that it is a toxic chemical. Um, per se, and then there are all these side reactions that can also give rise to um, sulfur containing toxic chemicals. And, and that is one reason why the technology is rather restricted nowadays, at least in Europe, even though originally developed in Europe, especially UK, Germany, but also other countries. Nowadays, there are very few factories left. Um, there is one in by Lansing AG in Austria, then there's one in Germany, there is in the UK, and the viscous process is still used by a couple of um, uh, cellophane producers across Europe, but the majority of the production sites is nowadays in, in the Southeast, in, in those countries where also typically environmental regulations are, are not as strict or not as enforced as in, in Europe. So there are this, this toxicity of CS2 and the problems associated to it, um, for me, make viscose, um, let's call it a phase out technology, but certainly nothing that will phase out tomorrow because the viscose process is still an, an excellent process. And the factories in, in Europe clearly demonstrate that despite the to toxicity of the chemicals involved, um, you can have safe operations. Um, this is a video that I, I will not show here, but if you want to see the different steps, um, Kalheim Fibers, so one of the viscous producers has put a very nice video on YouTube. So if you uh, search for viscous and Kalheim, you will probably find it and it shows very nicely the steps if you're interested in that. I showed you at the beginning already all the um, application areas of viscose and, and that alone explains already um, the success and the prevailing success of the viscose fibers. But with the viscose process, you can do more. And, and here you can see the versatility that it offers. So first of all, you can adjust different cross sections. That is only possible with uh, such a wet spinning technology that you have hollow fibers, you have certain um, shapes that you can give it. You can of course adjust the thickness of the filament and the uh, uh, the, the length of the staple fibers. We can incorporate particles. Those particles can be antimicrobial uh, agents. They can also be dyes so that we have colored fibers. And the viscous process even allows to mix it with other polymers, for instance, synthetic polymers, so that you have an in-situ blend for certain applications. Different cross sections. I just want to show you quickly what that is for. Um, Kalheim Fibers is one of those producers with these speciality fibers. And if we look at these uh, tribal shaped fibers on the left, um, they are very well suited for hygiene products because the water can adsorb very nicely here in those cavities. So you have a lot of water retention um, in, in these type of fibers. But also if you have hollow fibers or, or fibers with certain segments in there, um, also they give um, a lot of area for water to absorb. And also very important that this water is not released when you press your product or the fibers again. So the, the, the water is kept in there. So obviously this um, opens up uh, a lot of applications uh, in the non-textile sector, in particular for hygiene products. That brings me to our next technology uh, that is the, the tensile process. In the tensile process um, is here schematically depicted. And what I want to show with this slide is that how much simpler it is already. So we have um, our dissolution, we have the spinning, and then washing, finishing, drying, and that's it. There is none of these um, steeping, aging, um, ripening processes. So it's a rather straightforward process. However, it does require to have a, a separate solvent recovery unit. So in this process, it is key that you recover the solvent um, to a very high extent, keep it in the loop uh, and, and do not dispose it. The lyocell process 
um, is based on, on special solvents that can solubilize cellulose without any derivatization. That is this, the key the behind it. And um, if you look at the old patent literature, in 1934, Granaker was the first one to describe that this particular structure, NMMO, is capable of dissolving cellulose directly. So no uh, intermediate modification needed. Um, if we compare this now to the viscous process, you see it's, it's a lot younger. Uh, the first operations then started maybe at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. And at the end of the 60s, there was already an accident that um, led to the discontinuation of this development for a couple of years. And we'll talk about this accident a little bit later. Uh, and it was then only later at the yeah, beginning of 80s, around the 1980s, that uh, the development was restarted, um, in particular driven by Lensing. And uh, Lensing then over the, the years also acquired all the patent portfolio until it, it basically was the only producer of this um, technology. Nowadays, there are um, five plants. There are two in Austria, one in the UK, one in the US, and a very new one uh, that was just um, commissioned last year in, in Thailand, which is at the moment the biggest uh, lyocell um, manufacturer. But let's have a closer look at this structure, this NMMO. It is actually this um, polar and twitter ionic NO group that can interact with cellulose so efficiently that it can solubilize it. However, and a pure NMMO is not a cellulose solvent. Um, first of all, it has a very high melting point. So if you would liquefy NMMO and then um, insert it your cellulose, you would probably have already a lot of thermal degradation there. However, interestingly, if you add one mole equivalent of water that represents approximately 13 weight percent of water, then uh, the melting point drops below 80 degrees Celsius. And this particular mixture is then capable of dissolving cellulose. So as a matter of fact, if your water content is between four and 17 weight percent, then uh, you can dissolve cellulose in there. How is this done in practice? Let's have a look at this ternary diagram. So we have water on one axis, we have the solvent NMMO on one axis, and here is our cellulose. And typically you would start with an NMMO water mixture that is higher than this 17 weight percent. So it does not dissolve cellulose yet. However, this aqueous um, solution of NMMO has a very low viscosity. So you can disperse your cellulose pulp very easily in there. And then you start to gradually evaporate the water. So you decrease the water content. And by that, we are moving into this gray area here at the phase diagram, which is called the solubility window. So now the cellulose starts to dissolve and you have your NMMO cellulose solution with approximately 13 weight percent of water. And then all you would do is spin this again into an aqueous spin bath, so just water. At the moment you spin this into water, you basically reduce the NMMO content almost to zero. You jump over here and you have instant coagulation of your fiber. Now I mentioned that um, there was an accident during the development and that is because of this um, very unique structure. These this cyclic ethers, they are prone to thermal degradation, very um, exothermic thermal degradation. And uh, here's a video, which I hope streams nicely also on your screens, taken by the uh, Boko group in Vienna, group of Professor Rosenau, mixing NMMO with cellulose here. This NMMO powder, pure NMMO powder and cellulose, and um, they react with each other. And this reaction can be very violently. So there has been this explosion during the development and um, that stopped this development until it was understood um, what caused these so-called runaway reactions and even more that it can be prevented by a radical scavenger and nowadays typically propyl gallate is used. Nevertheless, there's always a rest risk now um, and in particular, if you have metal ions, metal ions can catalyze this uh, exothermic reaction. And, and obviously metal ions are always present if you process it on an industrial scale. Now the lyocell process differs or the spinning process differs from the viscous process in as much as that the spinning unit or the spinneret is not directly inside 
the spin bath as in the viscous process, but it's a little bit outside. And we have a so-called air gap. And this air gap is um, just a couple of centimeters, but in this air gap, we still have a cellular solution. So the filament that we are extruding is fluid at this point. And that allows us to stretch it. So we extrude with a certain velocity one, and we adjust the take-up velocity with our godets. And typically the take-up velocity is a multiple of the extrusion velocity, and that is defined then as the draw ratio. And it is this stretch that then causes the cellulose chains to orient along the fiber axis. In solution, cellulose chains have typically a random coil formation. They are a little bit aligned through shear stresses in the spinneret, but the, the draw, this stretch in the air gap really aligns the, the cellulose chains along the filament axis. And as it dives into the spin bath, the coagulation is so fast that this high orientation is then frozen or preserved in the so solid fiber. And you can see this also nicely on the uh, fiber structure. So we will see that later that this round, really perfectly circular cross section is a unique feature of lyocell type fibers. And then you see that it is made up of macrofibrils that again consists of a bundle of microfibrils. And then we have their crystalline and amorphous domains in these microfibrils. And there are, of course, the, the two theories there, fringe micelle or fringe fibril. In either case, what you have is a high amount of crystallites in there. And these high um, crystallinity then gives rise to the properties of um, the fibers. And we will have a look at that those then when we compare them with the viscous fibers and other fibers. So this technology at the moment is mostly used for textile application. Um, the, the generic name for the, the lensing lyocell fiber is a tensile. And as I mentioned for a long time, Lensing was the only producer, but nowadays there are also um, other big producers like Birla and Setri, building plants, uh, Setri in particular with a, a massive production of um, 500 kilotons per, per year that they're, they're planning to. Um, at the moment, the, the total global capacity is, is around that, so half a million tons per year. But then um, it is also possible to make films out of this, um, also powders, and also continuous filament, of course, not only staple fibers. Now let's compare the fiber properties a little bit. On the left side, we see the stress-strain curves. Um, we have here on the very bottom, the classical viscous. You see that the viscous is the weakest fiber, but the most flexible fiber, so it has a very high elongation. And then a lyocell would be here on the upper end, a very strong fiber, but um, a little bit stiffer. And that is inherently connected to the crystallinity, which you can see here on the right side. Um, so we have, again, the viscous fiber, cellulose viscous, the, the symbols are usually CV. We have a lyocell type fiber, and then we have variations of the viscous fibers, which have a slightly different uh, crystallinity. And, and that again is reflected in the strength and the elongation to break of these fibers. The cross section is also very uh, characteristic. So we have the, the lyocell fiber on the right, very circular cross section because we have only coagulation. Whereas in the viscous fiber and also in the, the modal fiber, we have um, these uh, physical reaction, we have a changing of pH, we have a coagulation of dexanthate, and then we have saponification of dexanthate, we have chemical regeneration. And because of this, um, the, the fiber usually collapses at some point, there are these osmotic pressures, and uh, the cross section is typically not as regular as in the case of the lyocell fiber. Um, for the better and the worse, of course, um, for certain applications, if we think back in the, on this uh, more hygiene applications, this can also be an advantage. And here on this table, you see where you can find these, these type of fibers. We have the viscous fiber, we have uh, lyocell fiber, uh, and we have modal fiber, and then often 
if you now go through your wardrobe and, and, and look for those fibers, you will find that they're in blends. Of course, the most common blend is cotton. So these fibers, they also have to be compatible with uh, cotton fibers, compatible in the sense that they should not differ too much in their strength or elongation of values, because otherwise your, your clothing will not keep the, the shape when you uh, repeatedly wash it. But um, if we look here, for instance, lyocell fibers, they have very good moisture management. Um, so you will find this in particular in things that are um, close to your body. Uh, that can be bed sheets, um, but also underwear, for instance. Uh, viscose is uh, typically used in um, uh, clothing that, that should have a, a very light drape. Uh, with light drape, I mean blouses, I mean dresses. So viscose is maybe a little bit more domin dominant at the moment in, in female clothing. Um, Man clothing is still more cotton or than uh, tensile. Um, although viscose is, for instance, all very common in suits. So in men's suits, the inner parts, there you will also find viscose very often. There is one more fiber that is on the market, and that's the so-called Cupro fiber. And again, I want to give you just a brief overview of the history. Also, that one was developed at the very end of the 19th century. And then uh, a company in Germany started to pick up the technology and produce these fibers, the so-called um, Bemberg AG. Uh, they teamed up relatively quickly with a Japanese manufacturer, Asai Kasei. And, uh, as of today, it is only this Japanese manufacturer that is producing this Cupro fiber. However, because of that history, it is still often sold as the Bemberg fiber. So it has this, this German name in there. And if we look at the, at the production volume here, you see 16,000 annual tons. So it's much less than, than viscose or uh, uh, lyocell process. It is a very simple simple process in terms of chemistry that uh, you form a copper complex with your cellulose and dissolve that copper complex in a caustic solution. And then once again, spin it into a sulfuric acid bath. As a feedstock, you, they are typically using very high purity cellulose, um, cotton linter. So cotton linter is the short fiber on the, on the cotton seed. The long fiber is typically used directly for cotton products. And then the short fibers can be used um, for these type of applications. And now let's quickly compare these fibers. Um, we have uh, the uh, viscose fibers, regular viscose fibers, and then we have here the cupro fiber and the lyocell fiber. And uh, what we could have a quick look at is the tenacity. So a regular viscose fiber has something between 20 and 25 centinewton per tex. Um, you see instantly that the cupro fiber is uh, weaker or in that range, whereas the lyocell type fibers, because of the high cellulose molecular orientation, is a lot higher. Um, more importantly, however, is that the lyocell fiber keeps the strength when it gets wet. And that is because of the high crystallinity and very few amorphous areas, whereas a regular viscous fiber has a lot of amorphous domains that swell when they get wet, and they typically drop in strength up to 50%. And then maybe one other feature that I quickly want to point out here is the dB of the cellulose in the fiber. If we compare viscose is a lot lower than, for instance, cupro, but also lyocell. And that is, of course, because of this original aging step where we want to degrade the DP and uh, change the molecular weight distribution. And we'll come back to that very briefly when we talk about fiber recycling a little bit later. But let's have a quick look at emerging technologies. So I want to start with a company Spinova, and that is actually quite exotic because um, it is the only technology that I talk about today that does not include the solution. And that's a big advantage. So if you can skip everything that's that's connected to uh, the solution, of course, you're saving a lot of energy, you're saving a lot of uh, chemicals, but also you're preserving the cellulose one structure. So that is very unique. And uh, this depiction here is actually from a completely different article um, by the Söderberg group where they, they um, extrude cellulose nanocrystals. However, the, the the, the working principle is, is so similar that I thought it's, it's a good way to uh, illustrate it. So 
uh, Spinova is using wood pulp, pulp fibers, and these pulp fibers are then um, aligned in a flow direction through shear, just as depicted here. And then these fibers are cross-linked um, with different agents. So in the patterns, you find alginate pectins, uh, you find divalent uh, ions. I don't know the um, exact composition. Of course, this is, this is really a company, so they are not publishing a lot. But this is the idea behind this. And then also the, the key uh, element in there is then to dewater this suspension. So once those um, pulp fibers in suspension have been aligned and cross-linked, water has to be removed. Um, and this is, um, according to their patents, done with uh, certain pressing and, and twisting units. Again, I have to say that that's all that I know about Spinov. I've never seen it with my um, own eyes. And uh, I'm sure that the, the actual equipment behind that is, of course, a lot more sophisticated. Um, Spinova has put their first commercial scale factory on, on stream last year as well um, in collaboration with uh, Susano and um, is now also looking into textile recycling. So they're collaborating with Renew Cell. Um, have a look at their web page. So they have um, quite a, a nice overview of their activities there. The other technology um, that I want to talk about today is the carbamate process. The carbamate process, if you look here at this scheme, is very similar to the viscous process, except instead of using the problematic CS2, they are using uh, urea. So urea is then reacted with the cellulose, is forming the so-called carbamate, and the carbamate again is soluble in caustic. So um, this de technology was developed also by um, Dupont in the middle of the 20th century, and uh, in particular also very early in Finland by Neste OU. And then um, there has been also a lot of activity in research activity in Germany and, and China on this. But at the moment, um, I think one of the few factories that are actually built up is in Finland, again, using this technology. Um, similar to the viscous process, the actual derivatization is rather low. So the aim is something between 2.5, 4.5% of nitrogen that corresponds also to a DS of um, around uh, 0 0.5. And that is then, as mentioned, soluble in caustic. And now if we look, this is another representation of the viscous process on the left and then on the right, the carbamate process. And you see how similar these, these processes are in general. So the unit operations are almost identical. And that also makes the carbamate process very attractive because at least in theory, it could be possible to convert present viscous mills into carbamate mills. Uh, the carbamate fiber, also there, there is not too much published. This is, um, well, meanwhile, also almost five years ago. So maybe not the best representation, keep that in mind. But uh, this CCA is the carbamate fiber. And as you can see here, it is a bit weaker uh, in terms of um, mechanical tenacity than the, the viscous fiber. So there is still something to be developed. The, the viscous is really basically the baseline when it comes to this fiber, you should not be much below that. Um, I'm sure the company is actually uh, developing that already uh, to a further extent. And um, this uh, company Infinite Fiber that is now uh, established here in Finland, they are ha also having, they, they chose a, a unique path in focusing on textile waste. So they are sourcing uh, a lot of cellulosics from textile waste and then process this using the carbamate technology into new fibers that are then used either directly or in blends with other fibers for new products. And this brings me to the last one, and that is our in-house development. So allow me to um, show you a couple of slides on the ion cell process. The ion cell process is also a lyocell type process, meaning that we A, dissolve cellulose directly without any intermediate derivatization, and we are using a dry jet wet spinning process. And the solvents are unlike NMMO ionic liquids that have been developed by our colleagues uh, Ilka Kilpelainen and Alistair King at the University of Helsinki. Um, the actual structure is maybe not that important. Essentially, they are a combination of a superbase, an organic superbase, and acetic acid. And with that, we can dissolve um, cellulose directly. And I mentioned already that also this is a 
uh, dry chat with spinning process. Once again, I hope this video is streaming nicely. Then you should be able to see the filaments coming out of the, our spinning unit, going through the air gap. Now they are stretched, they are aligned in this uh, air gap and then coagulating instantly in the, uh, in the coagulation path, which is pure water. So same thing, we have a high orientation of the cellulose chains. And again, it is a very simple fiber line. We dissolve, we spin, we wash, we cut and dry, and then it is shipped off for further processes. But like in the NMMO lyosol process, it is important and it is mandatory to recover the solvent. So you need a solvent recovery unit uh, attached to that. And solvent recovery means uh, evaporation of water and possibly also purification of uh, any degradation products that can come from either the solute, the, the lignocellulose or from the solvent itself. So the same uh, stress strain curve that I showed you previously, but now um, supplemented with the uh, green line, that's the ion cell fiber. So um, it's, it's a rather strong fiber um, in terms of elongation, similar to, to lyocell, uh, the tensile fiber. And if you look here at the SEM images, you can also see, of course, around cross-section fibrillar body. And that is an inherent feature of these lyocell type processes. Uh, over the years, what we found was that it's a very versatile process, so we can use different raw materials. This is just an, an overview of, uh, so not only dissolving grade pulp, but you can use paper grade pulp, you can use use print, so uh, TMP, also cardboard, uh, mix it directly with lignin. Uh, in, in Herbert Sixtus group, they also did uh, work with incorporating particles, so uh, if you add a uh, silver or a gold salt, then the reducing end of the cellulose can reduce these um, uh, metals in situ directly. So you don't no need any additional reducing agent. You're creating uh, nanoparticles. And these nanoparticles, in this particular case, for instance, they uh, have then uh, UV absorption effect. So we can get from uh, no particles around 20 to up to 50 um, uh, UPF, so um, UV protection factor. Also, what we were able to show is that you can incorporate natural hydrophobic substances in order to make these um, fibers at least a little bit hydrophobic or less hydrophilic, increase the contact angle with water. What is very important here, this is maybe the only thing I want to mention, is that if you want to incorporate something, um, you have to make sure that it is compatible with cellulose. So if it is too hydrophobic, you will actually have internal phase separation. Uh, you will form micro domains of your additives. And in this particular case, this was prevented by transferring betulin to betulinic acid. So the carboxylic group kind of acted as an anchor, dispersing the additive nicely across the fiber then. And I mentioned briefly already uh, textile recycling. This is also where we see um, the future, not only for the iron cell process, but for many um, cellulose fiber processes that we try to keep the raw material in the loop. Of course, we have degradation, we have losses. So we need to feed in fresh material, but to a lesser extent than we are doing it now. And here are just a couple of examples, um, maybe that I fly through now. Uh, there is hemp recycling. So uh, hemp is, is a very strong fiber, but it was very stiff that can be recycled uh, nicely through dissolution and respinning. Here is uh, cotton. Of course, that's the standard case. Uh, what you see here are cotton roll towels that you find in the bathroom. So we work with the supply of those. And once they are taken out of rotation and discarded, um, we took them and processed both the, the white ones, but also the, the dyed ones. And you can see that to some extent, you can also keep the dye in the system, in the fiber. And uh, this is um, one of the last examples that I want to show. And, and for me, one of the most important examples. So this is the viscous fiber that we recycled. Um, three different cases, are the, the standard white fiber, but then there was also a black and, and uh, a blue fiber produced by, again, Kaleheim fiber. So spin dye, they, they incorporate this um, pigment directly in the spinning. And uh, first of all, it was possible to recycle the white fiber, but not only that, because 
we are using the lyocell type process and because we can reorient the molecules on, on the molecular level, the chains on the molecular level, it is actually possible to increase the mechanical properties during recycling. So that is, that is a very unique thing. And the same is true for um, spun dyed fiber. And as you can see here on the uh, pictures, we are basically keeping the, the color intensity. There is no loss in color intensity either. And um, this is something that we're pursuing at the moment because we feel that could be a very powerful way forward in terms of real circularity in the textile sector, not only in material circularity, um, but also dye circularity. Very briefly, Ion Cell at the moment um, is upscaled as well. So it has actually been spun off uh, from the university. There is a, a now a pilot line, very small pilot line, I have to admit, with a production capacity of around 10 kilo per day. Um, but this process is now con uh, continuous. So everything is um, basically uh, already on such a level as it would be on a, on a large scale. The company was founded by Alt University. Uh, there's the CEO, Antti Rönke, and uh, Herbert Sixta is also one of the founding members. This is um, all I wanted to say uh, very briefly. Maybe I should spend a bit more time on this, but I, I don't have. And so that I just want to say very briefly, we are, of course, not the only ones using ionic liquid, developing an alternative process. Um, there's even another one in Finland, uh, like uh, the Kura fiber by Metzger Spring. But also in Germany, there is a development that is called Hypercell. So I'm sure that um, in, in a couple of years that there will be some fibers made from these ionic liquids on the market. This basically brings me to the end where I just want to very briefly summarize. Um, so the viscous fiber is the dominating fiber on the market and will remain to be so. I'm, I'm very convinced because it, it is a very optimized and established process and opens up a lot of application areas. So it, it is also in that sense still superior to many other technologies, despite the problems that it also comes along with. Lyocell fibers, however, are expanding um, also because the properties are really good and the, the, the customers, business customers, are um, eager to expand their Lyocell portfolio. And then there are, of course, uh, many new fiber technologies pushing on the market. And it will be very um, exciting to see what other fibers we will find in our wardrobes in five or 10 years from now. And with this, um, I, I will end my presentation and thank you for your kind attention.